when does he want to play it? I'm not sure. If he's worked now, I'll
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Isn't it wonderful to be able to get together and worship God in this place on this day? What a beautiful day. If you are a first-time visitor, either here or online, we welcome you. We're so glad you came. Any place where God is is a good place to be. Um, I did want to tell you a couple of things. First of all, there was an announcement up about youth group and meeting times, but the meeting time is 4 to 5.30. So if you have a youth who likes to come to youth, it's 4 to 5.30. I don't want anybody to show up at 2. Um, but if you do show up, there is a strawberry festival going on today for the men in the back, and I'm telling you, it is delicious. You should all come out. So with that, wait, wait, wait. what, what, what? Oh, and Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday is this Wednesday. Um, it's the beginning of the 40 days of Lent, and, you know, you have to give something up. What are you going to give up? You chocolate. Give up? You did, did you? <laughs> he doesn't eat chocolate. <laughs> he gave up giving up. <laughs> so there's a 6.30 healing service and anointing with oil and a 7 o'clock communion service. So if you can come on Wednesday, we'd love to see you then. Thank you. I was just playing with you about the key. I was just playing. I was playing. Please stand and worship with us this morning as we sing Beautiful One. <clears throat> One, two, three, four. In my eyes to your window, 
You captured my heart with this love because nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. Amen. You may be seated. Children's chat. We have children. Yes, early this time. are cool. Combat boots with sparkles. Those weren't uh, the, the way the military dress code was when I was in. Just putting it out there. Okay. So today we're talking about a guy named Naaman. Can you say what? Naaman? Naaman. I lost Howdy. my cookie. You lost your what again? Cookie. You lost the kazoo? Yeah. Yeah, technically we both, we both lost it. Did you lose it because you wouldn't stop playing it? No. You know what? When you get to be my age, that's a daily occurrence. Well, yeah, but we'll do a kazoo again. Yeah. Oh, she really? Yeah. yeah, she forgets that she puts it on your feet so you can wear her combat boots. Well, of course, it's got to be somebody's fault. Hey, we're going to talk about a gay guy named Naaman, and you know what? In this story, Naaman, who's a foreign general that has beaten Israel in battle, he loses it. He just loses it. He gets mad. That's not what you meant when you lost your kazoo, is it? No, no. no. We, were like, we were like, oh, I can't find it. <laughs> <laughs> Naaman knew where to find his healing, but he just didn't want to do it. See, Naaman was a general, and he had beaten Israel. And here's the deal. In those days when one country beat another country, you know what they did? They took slaves back. <gasps> and one of the slaves was a girl, probably a little bit older than you, but not much older than you. And she worked for Naaman's wife as her, her maid. And you know what? Naaman was a really strong military guy, but he had a problem. You know what his problem was? What? He had something called leprosy. You know what leprosy is? No. How about you? You don't know what leprosy is? Well, you're too young. You're too, when, when you become a teenager, you're going to get pimples. <laughs> uh-uh, not you? You've already got a pimple? All right, you guys are in trouble. Just saying, putting it out there, okay? But anyway, it's a skin disease, but it gets really, really bad. In fact, leprosy, while it's not completely cured, isn't the problem it was back in the day. All right, so here's the deal. He was scared. He was big. He was strong, but he had something he couldn't fix. So this little girl who was captive and made for his wife says, you know what, back where I'm from in Israel, there's a guy. Don't you love it when somebody knows a guy? They can fix your house, they can fix your car, they can fix you up with a date. I know a guy, all right? So she knew a guy named, well, yeah, it could have been Jesus, but it wasn't Jesus this time. No, no. God or something? Yeah, well, it was, it was, it was last, week, last week was Elisha, right? <laughs> now I'm confused. <laughs> See, I told you this happens more when you get to be my age. So anyway, so sh he goes back there and he expects that he is going to be told to go out and like conquer some, you know, three-headed monster or something like that. And you know what the prophet told him to do? What? Can you guys read? What's this say? Go and she beat you. Let's try it together. Go and wash yourself. She still beat you. Let's try it again. You ready? Are you going gonna to let a girl beat you? No. Okay, you ready? One, two, three. See, now this is what I'm talking about. See, but he, Naaman wasn't interested in going and washing himself. He wanted something big to do because he was important and he was strong and he was tough and he wanted to do it his way. But the prophet said either do it or don't. See ya. And he closes the door. Can you run? Yeah, anybody can run faster than me. Even the refrigerator runs faster than I do. Okay. So here's the deal. He did finally got over himself, and he went down to the Jordan River, and he washed seven times. He went under the water, and when he came up the seventh time, guess what? He was healed. And he's like, well, that's just crazy. Well, here's what I know about faith. Here's what I know about God. 
God uses things that sometimes don't make sense to help protect us and help to make us get better. Like this. You ever seen one of these before? Yeah. It's a mask. What do you do with this mask? Put on your I wear it here or in my pocket. That's where I wear it. Anyway, uh, no, but in the day when a leper had re- leprosy, they were required uh, in the Old I, Testament to I wear know. a mask. And they, anytime somebody came near them, they'd have to say, unclean, unclean. But you know what? God didn't want them to have to wear a mask and say, I'm unclean. He wanted them to get better. So God is the same with us. When we're unclean, when we say something or do I, something I, I that we shouldn't do, God says we simply say, I'm sorry. Let's practice that. Ready? One, two, three. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. And when you say that to God, it's like washing yourself in the Jordan River. Because if we confess that we were wrong, if we say, I'm sorry to God, God always forgives us and cleanses us, even though it doesn't make sense. Why would he forgive me? I didn't even hurt God. I hurt you. See? Told you. Oh, no, it's your turn. It's your turn. All right. I d- now, all right, let's put our hands together. Because I'll do this all day. Let's go ahead and put our hands together. <laughs> you ready? Yeah, yeah. Put your hands together. That way you're, you can't whack me with whatever that is. Dear God. Come on, church, help us out. Dear God. Thank you so much for making a way when I don't see a way and I don't even understand the way. Heal me now. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You guys ready for for Sunday school? Yes. All right. Go have fun. See, I didn't teach them to throw anything this morning. Aren't you glad? (laughs) Did he really? Yes. Wow. That is so cool. I don't know about the rest of you, but that's church for me. <laughs> oh, really? No, no second song? Yeah. Looking for Gary. Is Gary here? Come on up, Gary. Is Gary in the house? Gary in the house. Gary's speaker. He's going to speak. Oh, jeez. Thank you, Gary. Yeah. Let us pray. Lord, we live in troubled times. Mm. And now hostilities have broken out in the country of Ukraine. And many innocent men, women, and children will be exposed to unwanted troubles. We ask you today to please stop this violence that are going that they are going through. We lean on you this day, hoping and praying that this situation will stop, that our that our world leaders would rise in their leadership through your guidance and cease this action in the Ukraine. We also look to you to help us with our own situations. We are involved with every day in our own country, helping the poor, watching over our families, stopping the sicknesses, bringing our families closer together and able to live our lives in which you intended. Your scripture in Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to give you hope and a future. We all must be patient and pray together, give and guide our pastors, church leaders, government officials, and leaders of our churches, communities, and neighborhoods to show faith in these troubled times. And we pray the the prayer as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, Hallowed be be thy thy name, thy thy kingdom come, thy thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give Give us this day our our daily bread, bread. and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive our trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Thank you, Gary. You know, when we leave the safety of our homes and we go someplace, we usually go someplace with the thought of gaining, gaining something, getting something, going to the store, whatever it be. We come here 
to get our little piece of God. We get here to get replenished. We get here, get nourished, we, our spirit. So please stand as we, we sing, Here I Am to Worship. And we sing about Jesus who came, gave everything just for us. And Wayne's going to lead us in this song. Mixing them up. <laughs> Got to keep you guessing. <laughs> Please be seated. Yes. And get Wayne on the bass over here. I love worship time. It's worship time. Yes. This song is by Bebo, Bebo Norman. It's called Nothing Without You. We've done this before. And just understand that without God in our lives, we can turn up to be just nothing. Anything we try to do will fail in the end. Take 
take these hands and lift them up. For I have not the strength to praise you near enough. For I am nothing. I have nothing without. Take my voice, pour it out. Let it sing the song of mercy I have found. For I have nothing, I have nothing without you. I yield the floor. What's that old? Uh, oh, I want my time back. Ah, uh, you reserve the right to recall the witness. Yeah. Yes. You what have was that? Floor, what was that sir. old song from the '60s where the band refused to yield the field? Do you remember that? Oh yeah. Yeah, it was "Bye Bye Every American goes Pie." Bad all the time when he warms up. For and there's a great Christian song, right? <laughs> the three men that I admired most: the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Holy, see you right there. Yeah. I'm telling there, you, you know man. how this works. Yeah. Well, we are in week eight of ten, and uh, the series is called History, and it's based on this utterance of the Christ who said, you search the scriptures because why? You believe they give you eternal life. That's a nice perk, wouldn't you agree, right? As long as it's not an extension of this life. How many of you would like to live in this body of pain forever? Nah, not so much. Uh, but the scriptures point to who? To Jesus. That's exactly right. So today we're going to focus on the story of Elisha and Naaman, not Elijah. He was the, the guy who preceded Elisha as the prophet of Israel. But Elisha, who actually did twice as much as Elijah, but oftentimes get half the billing. Uh, and there's two other people in the story about Elisha and Naaman. And these two other people, that, by the way, is Naaman, the uh, foreign general coming up out of the Jordan River, cleansed of leprosy, which is what we're going to really focus on today. Um, these two questions. Why do people look for God? And why can't we typically find God? Those are questions that are relevant to all of us. So whether you're new to the Christian faith, just kicking the tires of this church or the Christian faith, or you just don't believe. You just come because your wife told you to get in the car and you thought you were going to go out for a burger and here you are. Okay. So, But the other two people in this story are going to help us uh, understand the answer to these two questions. Why do I look for God? And why 
though we so often miss God. Because God is where? Everywhere. So God is here right now. And God was in the car with you as you bickered about finding a parking spot. Oh, wait, that's not a problem. <laughs> so let's meet the first person. It's found in 2 Kings 5.1. He's uh, kind of the center of the story, but he's not who most Christians think he is. So just read with me the highlighted words. That way I know you're engaged and you'll get the story. So the king of Aram, okay, that would be modern day Syria. The king of Aram had high admiration for who? And he was the commander of his army. You know, commanders of the army don't always have uh, the admiration of the commander-in-chief, but that is the case here. Uh, because through him, the Lord had given Aram great victories. So he is not only a strong guy, he's not only a leader of men, he is a valorous guy. He's the kind of guy that stands up and says, let's take that hill, and people go, let's get going. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from what? Of all the disease you don't want to have, this is right there in the top three, okay? Uh, while as, whereas it's not as uh, ubiquitous today as it was in the day, it's still a challenge, especially in two-thirds world countries. So Naaman is not from Israel. Put that in your brain right now. A lot of people think that he was a general for the Israeli army, and it's not true. He doesn't even worship Yahweh, Jehovah. He doesn't worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Rachel, Rachel and Rebekah. He is a, a foreigner. And not just a foreigner, he's the one who has led the armies that have invaded and defeated Israel. But he is strong and capable. He is a success in the eyes of his king and his country. There are people like that moving around the planet today. Although the people in Russia, many of them, are standing up against the dictator. I think it's a shame we still call him president. He's acting like a dictator, causing the world to come to the brink of World War III. But that's not on me, that's on him. The best course of action really would be for his people to rise up and put him in his place. Haman is a foreign general. He is the guy, but he's the guy with a problem. How many of you would say that you have a problem in your life? So even though this guy's somebody else, we can relate to him, okay? Uh, leprosy was incurable, absolutely incurable. It ate your body one part at a time. Think zombie. There you go. You know, what's a zombie's favorite sport? Hockey. Don't you know why? Each, each uh, section of the, the game starts with a face-off. Ah. <laughs> Ah, uh, you came for a dad joke, I know. All right. Anyway, uh, 2 Kings 5, 2 and 3. Uh, uh, read this one with me. Uh, it's Aramaean. Just say it that way. Let's practice Aramaean, okay? And if you don't like that, call them Syrians, but that it ends up politically incorrect. So Aramaean raiders invaded Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who was given to Naaman's wife as a maid. How many of you have a maid? How many of you would like to have a maid? Okay. <laughs> See, yeah, all right, so she is a maid, and she's not getting paid, okay? We'd call that a slave today. All right, so one day the girl said to her mistress, Naaman's wife, I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria. Who is that prophet? We've already met him. Elisha, Elisha, right. And he would heal him of this leprosy. Well, you know, young girls can believe in old wives' tales, so why in the world would this strong man this leader of nation's army, why would he believe this slave girl who is functioning as maid of his wife? Now, listen to the bigger picture. She does play an important part, although it's just a momentary mention in the story. This girl is an unwilling missionary. You may be an unwilling missionary right now in your own life. You see, like Joseph, she... You remember Joseph, right? He was sold into Egyptian slavery. And do you remember how that turned out? God used a personal tragedy to accomplish a greater national and international good. So you just don't know how God will take the things that seem like, I shouldn't have to do this. I shouldn't have to be this. I shouldn't have to go there or 
God says, you know what? You can't see the bigger plan. She couldn't see the bigger plan. She was taken out of her parents' home, but probably was a godly home because she thinks of the prophet and she knows that the prophet has a track record of healing leprosy. So she says, I wish that your husband, my master, would go and see this prophet in Samaria. (sighs) She said that because she had God in her heart. Don't miss this. That's why her role in this story is so important although we've just about covered all of it. She has God in her heart, and that allows God to reach Naaman's heart. You may be the only godly influence in your family, or in your school, or in your workplace, your neighborhood, or this entire planet. All God needs is one open and willing and surrendered heart to change a heart even like Putin or Naaman. I'm so pleased that we live into this reality here at Roseland Church. It's called RCP. What's that stand for? Roseland Christian Preschool. These little adorable kids who took this picture at Christmas time, uh, I think they were singing to the unit, right? Didn't they come and sing? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but here's the deal. Like the girl in this story, these young children are captives in a world that, by and large, does not know God. It doesn't mean they're ignorant people. It means they're ignorant of God. Uh, So the words and actions these kids experience here, the love of God in Jesus Christ, will change the world out there, just like that little girl did with Naaman. So Naaman is described as a great and honorable man, a man of valor, but he had a problem, leprosy. It was because of his problem that he was willing to listen to his wife's maid's tale of how a conquered nation's prophet, Elisha, could cure him. So when you look at a problem, ask yourself this question. Can God use this in my life or somebody else's life? Look for a purpose behind the pain. Look for the reason for that season in your life. And you will discover what this little girl discovered. Because her master did go back to Israel. This time, he he did take chariots, but they weren't armed for war. They were filled with gold. So You never know what you're going to say or what you're going to do in a situation that's filled with stress and distress that will affect someone's life, someone's outlook on whether or not there's a purpose behind life and whether there is an author of life, there's a God. So Naaman told the king, his big bud, what the young girl from Israel had said. Read it with me. Go and visit the prophet. And the king told him, I'll send a letter. Stop right there. This letter is important. This is another character in this story, although it's not a human being. This letter is from one king to another king. This letter is like the red line, or the hot line, the red phone between Washington, D.C. and Moscow. So This king says, I'll send a letter, and you carry it to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out taking with him what? 750 pounds of silver and 150 pounds of gold. Oh, my goodness. Any idea what that might be worth today? I looked it up, did the calculations, and it was from online, so it has to be accurate, okay? (laughs) That's about $5 million. Now, that's a gift. Yeah, so, so Naaman started out taking as a gift five million bucks. Here's what I want you to see in Naaman at this point in the story. He didn't see his need for God until he felt a need that he couldn't fix. Even with lots of money, he couldn't offer that gift if he didn't already have the money. So he's rich and he's powerful and he's strong, but he has a problem he can't fix. So he's willing to get rid of some of what he has worked to accumulate. And it's not just true in Naaman's life, it's true in our lives. As we draw near the end of our time here on earth, most of us realize that we've probably, in many ways, majored in the minors, minored in the majors. We want to spend some more time with family and friends. We don't want to spend more time polishing our trophies or making sure the diplomas are not crooked on the wall. That's where he's at in his life. 
You can see the sunset. It's not as beautiful as it is here in Florida. So most of us don't feel the need for God. Oh, I'm doing pretty good. What's this whole God thing that Jerry's always talking about? We don't feel the need for God unless we find something that we can't fix. Naaman, like most of us, is seen in the eyes of his neighbors, his friends, as a basically good man. The Bible says he's an honorable man. God is not central to his life. In fact, he's described as a religious man. He worships the God of his nation, which is Baal. One of the religions that God specifically decries because they practice baby sacrifice. I say we can't imagine that, but don't we do that here in America today? In the old movie, It's a Wonderful Life, George Bailey, do you remember George Bailey? Yeah, yeah. In this scene, he's sitting at Martini's bar and he's desperately in need of $8,000. Why? Uncle Billy. He lost it. No, really, Potter, old man Potter stole it. If you want the entire dialogue, I can give it to you. I love this movie. So he's short 8000 bucks. The bank examiner's there, and he's at the end of his rope. He's sitting at the bar, having a drink, saying, and he prays. He says, and I wrote it down. He says, Father in heaven, I'm not a praying man. This is George Bailey. Neighbors think he's a great guy. He's uh, got many of them in a home. He's, he's been the guy who stood up against the tyrant of his day. If it was today, he would have stood up against Putin. He says, says, God, you know I'm not a praying man, but if you're up there and you can hear me, show me the way. That's an honest prayer. You remember the response to his prayer? Well, before he gets the angel, he gets up. Right in the kisser. (laughs) So, for most of us, we just don't feel the need for God. I mean, I'm basically doing all right. You know, things could be a little better, but, you know, I don't have any God-sized problems. So, we don't really need the real God until we're at the end of our rope. Like George Bailey, whose business is about to go bankrupt, or Naaman, the airman general who develops leprosy. Well, that's the answer to the first question. Why most of us look for God? So the second one was this. Why can't we find God? Maybe this will help. Jeremiah 29, 13. Read it with me. You will seek me and find me when. Stop right there. Read the yellow again. Find me when. Okay, you will seek God because your life isn't working. That's what we just said. And you'll find me when this happens. You seek me with all your heart. A half-hearted search for meaning, a half-hearted search for purpose will come up with answers, but they're answers that will fall short. The answer of God's love revealed in Jesus Christ. So you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. 2 Kings 5, 7, back into the story. When the king of Israel, there's that letter again, right? the one that was penned by the king of Aram to the king of Israel, uh, and this general who's strong and mighty but has leprosy has carried the letter to Israel. Uh, When the king of Israel read the letter from the king of Aram, he tore his clothes. Why Why did they do that in the Old Testament? I'm going to take a trip to the mall and get a new jacket. I don't know. Uh, He tore his clothes because it's a sign of great suffering, great distress. And he sends, and just listen to this, he says... He sends me a leper to heal. Am I God uh, that I can kill? Can he kill? With a word. Take that man out and execute him. So he can kill, but what can't he do? He can't give life. Leprosy is a death sentence. He sends me a leper to heal. Am I God that I can kill and give life? He's only trying to find an excuse to invade us again. The denazification... <laughs> of the Ukraine. If somebody's decided to fight you, they're going to find an excuse to swing. Ever been involved in a fight? You can see it in their eyes. It goes from a moment of confrontation to a moment of resolve. You know you better duck. So that's where he's at. He is a fighter as well, and he's been losing to this particular general. 
Who do you think this is a ploy, a strategy? Take away more of his country. to Take away more of his people. Jehoram is Israel's king at this moment in time. And he's upset because he didn't have the power to heal Naaman. And that's going to be a problem. It's been set up as a straw man to send his tanks back into Israel. He didn't have a relationship with this prophet Elisha, who actually could and has many times cured leprosy. But they were not buddies. In fact, Naaman wasn't welcome in the palace of Israel. And the third problem was this. The king of Israel was a head of a religion, but it was a dead religion. Just because somebody has been ordained, just because somebody has been put into the office of bishop or pope or anything else, doesn't mean that they have a vibrant, a real, a living faith with a living God. This is where it was in that moment in history with this king of Israel. He didn't really know Yahweh, God, any more than the other king on the other end of this letter. So the king of Syria, Aram, assumed that the king of Israel had a much better relationship with Elisha and with God than he did. Here's a takeaway. It's easy to assume that we have a better relationship with God than we really do. Let that sink in for a minute. Easy to assume that we or someone else has a better relationship with God than what we really do. And until the rubber meets the road until the wheels fall off your life, until you cannot fix it with your brain, with your heart, with your money, with your friends. You don't really know where your strength really comes from. Second Kings 5.8. Elisha, who is a man of God, he heard about the king's reaction and he sent this message to him. Read it with me, would you? Why are you so upset? Why was he upset? Because he was going to die. His country was going to suffer because he didn't know God and he couldn't cure leprosy. So why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me and he will learn that there is a what? A true prophet here in Israel. There are always true spokesmen and women for God in every nation and every generation, including ours. Why are you so upset? Don't hear that in a pejorative sense, although I'm sure that he had an edge to it that, you know, the king of Israel wouldn't miss. But it was also an open invitation. It was more than anybody here ever played Monopoly. Do you remember what this is? I must be out of the program. Could you advance the slide for me? There you go. What is that? Yeah, yeah. So he's offering the king a get-out-of-jail-free card, but it's more than that. It's an invitation to a deeper and more authentic relationship with God. So when you just squeak by and get out of a difficult moment, don't just experience it, oh, gosh, I can't believe I made it. It's like the the guy who who was, uh, you know, from the north, he's out swimming off, off of the Atlantic here in Florida, and he doesn't understand what a riptide current is. Anybody know what that is? So he misses the signs in the water, doesn't understand the flags that's flying. There isn't a lifeguard out there because nobody stupid would be in the water, right? No, no, that's exactly where the stupid people are, all right, <laughs> when the riptides are. So he gets out there, and he's, he's trying, he gets caught in a riptide. He's trying mightily to swim against it back to the shore. And then, you know, he's like, God, if you'll get me out of this, <laughs> I'll, I'll become a priest. I don't know how I'm going to tell the wife, but I'm going to become a priest, Okay. <laughs> And so, and there's this whisper in his ear that says, swim parallel to the shore. There's your takeaway if you're going to the beach this weekend, okay? Swim parallel to the shore until you don't feel the tug taking you out to sea. And so he does. And he gets back up on shore. He's exhausted. And he says, never mind, God, I got out of it myself. (laughs) If you get by, if you get through, it's not just to get out of jail free car invitation to accept that there is a God, a superintending force is what Abraham Lincoln called him, that is still at work in this world, working towards your greater good. 2 Kings 5, 9. It's just not advancing for me, I don't know. So Naaman went with his chariots. This time again, he doesn't carry arms, he's carrying what? Five million books. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he waited at the door of Elisha's house. So the king uh, sent him to where he needed to go. Uh, but Elisha did what? Sent a messenger. So some guy comes to your house. Let's say they came from Indiana. Let's say it's the governor of Indiana. And he knocks on your door. Actually, he's probably still in his chariot, sent somebody to knock on the door for him. And uh, you look out the window and you see who it is. And you go, oh, I know why he's here. And so you send out your maid. Remember, you have a maid now, right? <laughs> you send out your maid to tell him, you know what? I'm kind of busy. Here's what you need to do. Yeah, you're already seeing what the problem is with Naaman's personality. Uh, so he said, go and what? Wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of leprosy. So many of us want a faith that is really what we can do. So many of us want magic, not a miracle. So many of us want a one and done, not a relationship. That's not what God is offering. Go and wash yourself. It's not your preacher. It's not your parents, it's not your grandparents, it's not your church, it's not your denomination, it's not the color of your skin or the the balance in your 401k plan. It's you. If you want to be cleansed, if you want to be made whole, wherever your brokenness is, it's you need to go and wash yourself in the grace of God. Now, here's what I know. I think of this story at this point in time, and I remember baptism. I can't help but remember baptism. And a running argument we have with Reformed theologians. You know, we practice infant baptism. Did you know that? Uh, We're going to prove that here in a couple weeks. We're going to baptize two infants here in this church. Okay, at this service, as a matter of fact. I love baptizing babies. I do. Because, you know, they don't fight me. (laughs) They're just kind of like, hey. You see that meme in the... uh, on Facebook where the, the kid is sitting there and he's on, you know, infants on a cell phone with a look. He says, I'm not kidding you. Uh, we were in church and this, this old bald guy drowned me and my parents were laughing and taking pictures. <laughs> Go and wash yourself. It doesn't matter that your wife is saved. It doesn't matter that your kids are saved. It's good that they are, but that won't save you. Go and wash yourself. And you will be restored and renewed and revitalized. Naaman traveled a long way to speak with Elisha. But Elisha refused to give him a personal interview. He simply sent out a messenger. And this was a humbling experience to Naaman, who was accustomed to being honored. What do you suppose it really means to seek God with your whole heart? What do you think? Maybe this could go into part of your definition. God, read it with me, the whole thing. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So what do you you think it means to seek God with your whole heart? It means you come to him as a helpless person. Come to him without any ideas. It means you come to him not trying to sell him your agenda. You're open for what God tells you you must do. You're not trying to reassert your opinion by finding a proof text somewhere in the Bible and take it out of context so it says what you want God to say. God will resist that kind of theology every single time. God resists the proud but gives what? Grace to the humble. He will answer your need. Naaman is the original anchorman. You remember that show with... Will Ferrell, you guys ready to play that clip? Some of you, I can't believe that preacher showed this clip in church today. That's the point, okay? Can we roll it? Do you know who I am? No, I, I can't say that I do. I don't know how to put this, but kind of a big deal. Really? People know me. I'm very happy for you. I'm very important. Uh, I have many leather-bound books, and my apartment smells of rich mahogany. We laugh, and that's the whole point of that lampoon. 
We don't do that just with other people. We do that with God. We posture before God. God resists who? He gives grace to who? Haman's not humble. This is what happens. 2 Kings 5.11. Naaman became what? Here, just listen. I want you to get the inflection. I thought that he would surely come out to meet me. Does he know who I am? I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> Nothing else. He wants to meet a celebrity. Oh, I met Naaman. But he didn't. You see, he didn't feed into his pride. He says, I expected. He came there with his own agenda, just like we do when we come to God. I expected him to wave his hand. How's that in the Hogwarts? Swish and flick. There you go. Uh, he wanted not a miracle. He wanted magic. I expected him to wave his hand over this leprosy and call on the name of who? His God. I'm not interested in a relationship. I want to fix. And I brought five million bucks with me to buy that fix. And when somebody comes into my office, we had one just last week, and they're not bad people. They're just like you and me. And I heard him say in a loud voice, I need to see the pastor. And so Linda sent him back. Thank you. <laughs> really, that's your job, you know? And I always offer prayer. This is a house of prayer. You don't turn God's house into a, a den of thieves. That's Jesus' words, not mine. He was pretty serious about it, by the way. And inevitably, not always, but inevitably, uh, a majority of the time, what do you suppose they want? Money. So he didn't bring me $5 million. <laughs> he wanted five bucks. And... Uh, so he wasn't interested in prayer. He wasn't interested in anything other than getting his five bucks and some clothes. He got his clothes, but he didn't get his five bucks. See, this story was fresh in my mind because I was preparing for this message. I expected you to wave your hand over my problem and give me five bucks. Because your God says so. I don't want to know your God. I don't want to use the church for anything but a vending machine. Some of you feed into that toxic charity as if somehow that's biblical, but it is not. There's another takeaway. Always offer the Christ with everything we do. Always default to grace. If the man was hungry, I'd have taken him for a hamburger. He wasn't. He was using the church just like Naaman wanted to use the prophet. God takes a very dim view of that. He gets so mad. Aren't you glad he brought friends, servants with him? And he said, are you kidding me? He said, you know, you came here expecting to get this heroic adventure you'd have to do to get, earn your healing. And he said, you just got to go down to the Jordan River and dip yourself seven times and you'd be healed. And he says, no, no, we've got better water back home. <laughs> he really did. It's in the story. Read it. I, I cut out a lot of the details, but I encourage you to read these stories for yourself. So he says, we got better rivers back home. Why would I do that? I'd have to get off my high horse. I conquered this nation. I own this prophet. His God is subservient to my God, but all. The prophet says, I don't want to have that discussion. Here's what you must do. Go and what? Wash yourself where? In the Jordan River. And it's not really that body of water. You don't get to choose God's salvation plan. Well, God should. And I have a right. And God must. God resists who? The proud and gives grace to who? The humble. He's got five million bucks. And he fully expects to be able to buy this prophet's blessing. Ah. <sighs> Here's the deal, to Elisha's credit. He gave him the answer he needed. He didn't give the audience he wanted. He refused to take the cash. So many pastors that should read this story and understand that point for us. Anybody who uses a position of authority in the church for personal gain is wrong. You cannot justify a $500 ego to build a monument to yourself. You cannot justify a $5,000 gold-plated 
anything. I love Billy Graham for many reasons, besides being a clear prophet of God. He was a humble man. He lived in a very conventional one-story house. He didn't have something he tried to write off that was, what was it, 10,000 square feet was the latest pejorative thing on some big name in the evangelical world. Trying to claim a parsonage exclusion for that 10,000 square foot mansion. When the heat is on, we want to negotiate with God. If you get me out of this, I will. Here's the final takeaway I want each of us to have. God does not negotiate. God has a plan to prosper you, to heal you, to use even your pain for your greater good and the greater good of others. But God will not negotiate. You must come to God like this. That's one of the reasons I love infant baptism. It's not because you said a prayer. And that's not because you believe 0.5% of what God hopes we'll believe by the time we die. So an adult-only baptism is a spit in the face of this point of our theology, at least in a Wesleyan worldview. You come to God this way. You just coo and smile, or you cry and scream, but you get God's attention by humbling yourself. And trusting that God will feed you. And trust that God will change your dirty diapers. When you're done, and you smell better than you did when you came, (laughs) God is saying, now get back out on the playing field of life, and I'll be there when you scrape your knee. That's God's real plan. Everything else is fake. And everything else is human works and human righteousness. It's pride. God will not negotiate. He did not negotiate with Naaman. He did not negotiate with George Bailey. (laughs) And he will not negotiate with you or me. God desperately wants to heal you. His son Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary and died for your healing. Your part isn't to pay for that. Jesus paid it all. Your part, my part, is to believe on Jesus. Like the prophet in the story. One the sinner couldn't see. Told you what you must do. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do that. This week we begin the 40-day journey to Easter called Lent. This year at Wednesday morning at 7 o'clock we have a communion service and we'll also add imposition of ashes. At 6.30, is that right, Linda, 6.30, Wednesday night? We will have a healing service as well as imposition of ashes. It's not a Benny Hinn thing. Don't bring your handkerchiefs to have, you know, oil rubbed on and take it home. That may work. I've never seen it work. Bring your heart. Not a proud heart, but a humble heart. Bring your real issues. Come and kneel before a loving God who wants to heal you. We will see. The world will call miracles. How many of you want that? How many of you are willing to go down the river or are you going to stay on your high horse? God should do it my way. This is the way that works. See you Wednesday. Please stand. And we'll close our service with Your grace is enough.
I'm not teasing, really. <laughs> One, two, three, four. to have such a good team up here on the worship platform. Yeah, yeah. You know, and this is part of group therapy up here for crying out loud. So catch them around town. You know, this is only half a session. You get the full thing out around town. Uh, God's grace is enough. No matter what the baggage you're carried in with you, uh, leave it at the foot of the cross. And we'll see you Wednesday night and we'll do it again. Because most of us, once we confess and leave it at the foot of the cross, we grab it and take it back home with us. Uh, that's human nature. Don't let Satan beat you up by that. Just trust that God's grace is enough. Go forth in the love and the grace of God to know that you are forgiven. Nothing you've ever done or failed to do can separate you from the love of God and Jesus Christ. That is a promise straight from the throne of grace into your heart, into your situation. Uh, one public service announcement. We begin at 1230 serving... Let's see, strawberry shortcake, strawberries, mm -hmm. covered, chocolate covered strawberries, strawberry, strawberry milkshakes, strawberries. all things strawberry. strawberry. Okay, cookies, Brim. 
Yeah, even I frosted a couple of uh, stick. crispy something or others. I don't know. All right. So we'll see you uh, later today and then this week as we kick off Lent. God bless each of you.